talking about uh, my profession, profession, I'm a chiropractic physician. Um, for the kids here that may be interested in that profession, um, I, I get called into court a lot to testify for my patients who have been in auto accidents or slipped and fall. Well, if they want to know about an injury and I'm going to treat them, then they'll, they'll uh, subpoena me in to get on the court and call. So the first thing I want to know is what's the education you know, compared to a medical doctor. The education is the same. It's eight years out of high school. You do your pre-med. Then after your pre-med, then you apply to chiropractic school. You get in. That's another four years. The curriculum is the same until we get to the last year. The last year of med school, they're going to be doing surgery. They want rotations to do surgery and pharmacological uh, manipulation or, or medicines. We don't do any of that, so we take more x-ray, more uh, neurology, and more osteopathy. So we, we get a little, bit, a little bit ahead of the number of doctors as far as those three things. Of course, they are doing surgery and, and, and pharmaceuticals. Then after that, chiropractors can go right out, open up, get a pass the state board. Um, when I, 30, I've been here 31 years, so I had to take uh, the national boards, number one, two, and three, all doctors, if they're podiatrists, MDs, chiropractors, or dentists, they have to take the, the national boards all at the same time. These are, the, the, they're testing your knowledge, have you come up to par for this part of your education? So national board one, then national board two, national board three. Then at, at, when I came out of school, I had to go to each individual state and sit down for a, a pretty in-depth test. It was a two-day test. One was written, and then the other was practical. They would ask me to do things, you know, like, hey, there's a C1 that's subluxated. How would you do this particular move on it? And then I have to show them how I would, how I would do that. Um, and now they have it where you take a, a board four in school, so it's board one, two, three, and four. And the fourth one uh, is good for all states now. So it's a lot more like the, like the medical doctors. But the uh, education is the same. We have, have we follow the same. We have to follow the same legal standards as an MD. If I miss a particular uh, problem with, a, with a, uh, a patient and they get injured because I either missed something or I didn't do something, according to my peers, I have I suffer the same consequences as a medical doctor would. We're held in the same same esteem on that. We are uh, recognized by the Supreme Court of Alabama as a physician. Uh, years ago about 25 years ago, there was a case where a defense attorney for all states said, this chiropractor can't uh, testify because he's not a physician. And so they had to take it to one court, the other court went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, no, within their scope of practice, they are physicians just like a medical doctor or a, or a dentist. So that's something I always take to court over that particular thing. But anyway, that's the educational background. Who has who has uh, been to a chiropractor before for, for treatment? Two, two of you? Okay. Hey, three back there, four back there. Um, so um, I'll explain a little bit about it because a, a lot of people, if you don't, have not been to a chiropractor, you don't know what we do. We do this, when you first come in, let's say someone has back pain and they have pain going down their leg, um, their foot's starting to get numb, and they're starting to have a little bit of trouble with their, their leg. They come in my office and we have to triage them and, and diagnose them the same way any other uh, neuro or ortho would have to do it. So they'll come in, fill out a bunch of papers, like, you know, signed HIPAA forms and all that legal stuff. Then my nurse will take them in and ask them questions. Where does your pain go? Where does, it, where does it start? Where does it go? How far does it go down the leg? Is it sharp shooting? You know, all the characteristics. None of this is where. In the thighs, and the foot. Okay, can, are your urine okay? Are your bowels working okay? There's a bunch of questions that we have to triage. Once I get those notes, and they'll come into my office and say, okay, here's a new patient, um, and I'm, I still don't know if I can treat this patient or not. I have to go through a protocol. So I'll come in, I'll say, uh, Mr. Uh, Smith, I'm Jones. So, and my name is Dr. Royce Jones, by the way. Sorry, I didn't, we didn't get that out. So I'll say, Mr. Smith, I see here that my nurse, uh, you told my nurse you have pain in your back, and it's going down your butt and down the back of your leg. And he said, yes, I do. And I asked him a few more questions, you know, use it about different body functions. I said, well, let's do an exam. So then at that point, we'll do a physical exam, uh, range of motion, which is basically, can you bend over, touch your toes, extension, side to side. This is all lower back exam. Then I'll lay him face down, and I'll palpate down the spine um, to see where there's irritation. I'm just going to use this like, a, like an exam table. So this is, have you guys taken anatomy, human anatomy? Sounds cool. Next semester. This is a spine, um, the, the general parts of a spine of a human being. This is the, uh, the this is to scale on this. This is the back of the skull. So, and these are the bumps you feel when you run your hand down someone's spine. These are the the ilium bones. This is the again, this is the front, like you're looking at me. So, if I put my hands on my hips like that, I'm not really putting them on the hips, which is here. I'm putting them on the iliac crest, which is here. So, this is the pelvis. Pelvis is made up of an ilium, an ilium, and right in the middle, there's a keystone here called a sacrum. It's like a, it really looks like a keystone, a, 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 a triangular 
shape bone. And then from the ilium, we have the true hip bones. This is, this is the leg bone that makes, us, that makes us walk. So anyway, I'll lay the patient down, and then I'll start to palpate. I'll go to the SI joints first, and I'll, I'll palpate. So, yeah, oh, that really hurts, doc. So my nurse is over taking notes for me. You know, pain at the right SI, left SI. Then I'll go up these, the joints. These are the actual joints that we're looking for to, that we're going to actually adjust or treat. These are called the facet joints. They're on, there's, there's one on each side, and this is what gives the, the spine its ability to move. It's not just a, it's not just a post, not a solid uh, bony post. So the, the, it can twist, it can spine, it can go side to side. So we basically just get our information, ouch, 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 we relate that. I say to the patient, well, we have pain at the, you have right leg pain, we have pain at the right facet joints at 5, L5, L4, um, and L3. The, the joint, the, the nerves here, these three joints form the sciatic uh, nerve. So this is S1, that's uh, L5, and that's L4 nerve. Those three come down through the operator and into the, into the buttocks area. And they, they, because they come into a, a conduit called the sciatic conduit. The sciatic conduit is just like the three nerves are in there. Fourth nerve, fifth nerve, and the S1 nerve are all in there. And after that, they split off in different divisions. So if we find positives there, then the next thing we do is x-ray. So the patient will go then into x-ray. I never tell anybody I can treat them without doing an x-ray because we have just found, we found too many things that would have been missed without an x-ray. So the patient will go in, my nurse will take x-rays, they'll take, we'll take front views, and then we'll take side views, then I'll read my structures. Once I read my structures, then I can, um, I, I realize there's, there's a, a good protocol to start uh, treating the patient, so then I start treating the patient. We, we, uh, what we're trying to establish here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda just, we see so many ruptured discs in our practice, that's basically what we do. Um, so I'm going to kind of just stay with like, this is a, a low back disc problem, a blown out disc, a herniated disc. So this is what the low back looks like normally. So that's, this is normal anatomy. You see the disc has two areas here. It's got this, it's got this real tough um, uh, uh, ligaments that wrap around. It's a fiber li ligament uh, container. Uh, the annular fibers is the technical name. And then inside, there's a gooey ball of gel called the nucleo pulposa. So that's what it should look like, nice and tall. We should, we should have discs that are stand up like this. As you see here, this is phase one, phase two, and phase three. If I damage this one right here, it would take 10 years to get to here, 20 and 30 years to get here. You can see they're dehydrating as they're, they're losing the water content. They're drying out, they're shrinking, and they're cracking. See the little cracks in there? And now the container fiber, or the, I'm sorry, the container uh, nucleus can actually leak out through those, those, uh, those fibers. This is a herniated disc and it's slammed into a nerve. So the person I just talked about, this is what that person would have. Now, I'm gonna open this up a little bit. You see how the, the inside goo is now reached to the outside? And that's abnormal. You, you've heard of ruptured discs, blown out discs, herniated, protrusion, extrusion, sort of a bunch of names and all has to do with the character, the characteristics of what the actual disc looks like on the MRI. So that, that term will come from a radiologist. They will look at MRI, they'll say, this is a bulge, this is a broad-based bulge, this is a protrusion, this is a herniation. So it depends on how advanced it is. So we have this guy here, and there's op the options that this person will have. When we, and I, I haven't done an MRI in most of these patients yet. Um, I've just done the x-rays, but I have enough information to get going. I'll, I'll probably see this, or at least a decrease, at one of the areas of four or five, the, the nerves that we're thinking are in trouble. So. Um, when we start treatment, what we're doing here is we want to release the pressure on that nerve. Now there's two ways to do that. It's called decompressing, decompressing the nerve. You can surgically do it, and that's when a surgeon will go in and cut all the bone out from away from the nerve until you just kind of have the nerve just uh, kind of dangling in there. They'll take out the disc, they'll take out the bone, they'll take out ligaments, muscles. They, they have to excise a lot of stuff out of there. And it's kind of like the rotor rootering around the nerve so the nerve is decompressed and now it's not getting that pain and numbness and tingling. That, 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 that works okay, but the failure rate gets to be pretty high after about five years because gravity is pushing down. You know, the thing about the spine holds us up against gravity our whole entire life and the lowest one is, has the maximum gravity. So this is where the most common ruptures are, L4 and L5, in particular L5. So we have to decompress this. The way I do it, um, and so we try to keep these people out of the surgery. Is I have an um, instrument. This is a, a basic instrument. We only use these for sinuses and for babies and infants and newborns. 
Um, the instrument I have now is pretty advanced. It has a computer in it, so it's a smart instrument. It's connected to the wall, and so it actually it actually fires this. But it came off this technology. This is called an activator. Chiropractors have different techniques that they'll use to uh, open up the joints. The uh, one that most people think of is the chiropractor puts you on the table and you go pow, pow, pow. You feel yourself crack, crack, crack. You've, and that's actually the joints opening up and freeing up. That's what the sound is, and that's really what you want to do. I'm. We work with a lot of. Uh, patients that can't have that kind of technology or um, that technique. So I use this very specific technique and this fires, this is a, this one's spring loaded and it, it fires at a very, very fast um, speed that I can't match with my hands. So we can come down with the pressure. The, 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 uh, the uh, most common chiropractic adjustment will be to use the hands and then to or taught to fire very, very fast. But we have to use a lot of pressure to do that. This one has a lot less mass, but it's going to have to travel at a faster speed. So we kind of get the same thing done. So here's the problem. We have a joint that's, that's not moving. So if I tried to traction this, I would just move two of these vertebrae together. It wouldn't do any good. So we've got to open that joint, and that's, this is what we call an adjustment to the spine. So I'll come in here, and of course we know, as doctors, we know the angles. If we came this way, we would, we would worsen the condition because we're actually putting the, the joint closer together. So we come in here, and we, we fire like that, and this fires, and I can, put the, I can put the level of it a lot higher if I want to. And that fires and opens that joint. After the joint's open, and I have a little bit of freedom of motion, that's really what we're looking for right there. Once I can feel that move, then I can do traction. Uh, well, I do have an instrument, um, and, uh, actually it's a, a Japanese orthopedic instrument, it's a decompressive chair. Have you heard of inversion chairs or tables? Inversion tables, they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to, they're trying to pull this open. So the, uh, typically, before I use the chair, I'll do it by hand and I'll stretch that open. And here's what we're trying to do. There's the nerve and pinch. Once I get that sliding, then I can stretch that open and decompress it. And you can see that the pressure comes off the nerve. And that's what we want to do. It takes typically about 12 treatments to do that. Once I finish the 12, we reevaluate the patient. And if their pain is gone, nervous is gone, then we're, then we're, then we're good. We know we've been successful. And at uh, that point, we usually put the person out for once a month to come in, get rechecked, make sure that, that pressure stays off the nerve. The, if we fail at it, um, and our, our percentage right now is about 90% success rate. So if you give me 100 ruptured discs with pain down that are surgical discs, we can take care of about 90%. 10%, no matter what I do, I can't get them well, we have to send them to the surgeon. Uh, we, have a, we have a real good network of surgeons here in Birmingham that we send them to that we really trust. And then the surgeon will have to do a surgical uh, repair on that. But that's, that's basically what we do. Now, kids that come in, we see all age groups from um, newborns. Most of those are just, they're fussy, they're colicky, um, uh, they're not sleeping real well, their sleep pattern's off, um, ear infections, that those, they respond good to that. Um, your children uh, that are uh, have a nighttime urination, I've worked on several of those kids. I haven't gotten any results with those, but, but the babies with ear infections, we've done really good on that. So I use this instrument on the babies, and it's usually just the first and second vertebrae up here in the, in the neck that helps with the sleeping pattern. Uh, ear infections is always C2, that the nerves there communicate with the uh, ears, so that usually gets them sleeping better, gets their ear infection uh, gone. Clear, most, most of them clear up on that. The, um, uh, again, the major thing I work on is ruptured discs with, with adults. And we see, a, we see a lot of Medicare patients because they just have a lot of aches and pains. They have a lot of this kind of stuff going on in their spine. And so we have to take care of that. But the, um, when we do go to court, we're coming in there, we're testifying really to people like you um, that are called the lay people. And some of these things are hard to understand so we, we take out this oversized, supersized, it's called big bones. And this is actually just the neck here. So this is the back of the skull, that's the back of the skull. These are the seven vertebrae. It just goes down to that right here. But it's hard to show the jury that they're kind of scattered out. It's kind of hard to show them that. So we get this is a, a model, it's a medical model, so we can oversize the bones and kind of blow it up so we can see. So the, in the neck area, the reason uh, the neck is so important is because the spinal cord goes through there. You can see, you see where the spinal cord goes? Th this would really be great for your, for your classroom too. But the, the uh, nerve, that's actually the spinal cord. The brain sits here. Uh, this, uh, um, 
the brain, or the, yeah, the brain uh, stem is here, and then anything below this is the spinal cord. So if someone comes in and has an injury where their, where their uh, vertebrae are slipping and sliding to the point where it's hurting, it's kind of strangulating the spinal uh, uh, cord, that's a real serious problem. That can, if it's up higher, that can lead to seizures, headaches, passing out, syncope. Um, we've had several um, teenage girls that had um, injuries, uh, bad trauma to their head. One was a four-wheeler flipped it and was unconscious for a few days and went to the hospital, came out, had seizures, uh, multiple seizures a day, passed out all the time, and then had severe headaches and they can't function. This girl was 16. We had four of these, almost identical. She was 16, so she couldn't drive, couldn't go to school, um, couldn't have sleepovers, couldn't even get in the ocean or a little swimming pool unless her mother was there, because at any time they could just pass out. They went to all the, they went to even, you know, uh, UAB, uh, Mayo, you know, all the neurologists, or orthopedic surgeons, and on this one particular thing called a cranial, uh, cervical cranial syndrome, which happens up here in the upper area, there's, there's only one way to diagnose it, and it's with motion x-ray. You can't see it on MRI because MRI is, is a still uh, position on the image. CT, you have to sit real still. An x-ray, remember, if you had x-rays, they say, okay, hold real still, and they wind up the machine and take the picture, and you're not allowed to move. But it's all missed because you can't see what's going on without the motion. So with motion x-ray, it's the same thing as an x-ray, except it's a movie. It's like a video. So now you can see all the joints in the neck moving, and, you, and the problem just pops right out, and it's very clear to see even for lay people. That's something that, that uh, our, we're the only ones in this area that have the uh, DMX. It's called Digital Motion X-Ray. It's produced out of Florida, um, Tampa, Florida. It's where the company's based. A lot of doctors have it. A lot of medical clinics use it. Uh, there's um, several chiropractors I know throughout the nation keep in touch that have it. There's two or three in Atlanta. I think there's one in Birmingham, one in Mobile, and I'm the only one in this whole North area. So we get referrals from all over when we get these particular cases. Um, when we, when we go to court, we take these, and if we're explaining that particular um, injury, and thank goodness it's rare because it's very devastating, and it's almost undiagnosable by modern medicine unless the modern person has the DMX motion x-ray. If they do motion, they see it. So this is the, um, this is the only the first three vertebrae. So it's, let's look at it. The occiput C1 and C2. Okay, C1 is just a ring around the spinal cord. The ligaments are very complex up there. I won't, I won't go over the names of them because you won't remember more than likely. But these are the, all these are ligaments in here that help hold this C1, C2 spinal cord with you there so that you can still turn, you know, and not pinch your spinal cord. And, but the ligaments hold all that together, hold the integrity together. So normally you have good motion, but you have normal motion. Have you guys heard of the ACL tear in football? That L is a ligament, and, and when the, what the doctor does when he runs on the, uh, what Dr. Andrews, if he's at a football game, he'll run over there, the guy's laying down with his knee, and he'll do a drawer sign and that to see if that's loose or not. In fact, I took my dog today um, to the vet because we came home this weekend, and her leg was paralyzed. And, and we asked Grandma, what happened? But nothing. She didn't fall. She didn't slip. No, I took the leg, and I worked it all over, and nothing was sore. Um, so I took her to the vet. However, the last couple of days, I've been adjusting her L4, L5, and I did laser therapy on her. And so I took her off the vet. said, okay, let me see how she's limping. So I put her down, and she just walks all over the place. Like, oh, come on, Bella, come here, come here. Trip, trip, I'm on trip, come over here. I said, well, I swear, for two days, this dog, his leg is, she's, but she'll take a little step, and it collapsed on her, take a few steps. She was falling down, she couldn't jump up on steps. And he said, he checked her over, and he checked her patella ligament and her ACL. He did the same type of thing on my dog to see if the knee, if the ACL was, was busted. And he said, that's tight. That's good and tight. So that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for these ligaments to be good and tight up there. That's what you should have. Mobile, to a certain extent, there's a normal range of motion. And range of motion means if I do my elbow like this, it should stop there. If it goes on down like that, I've got problems. That means I've got some ripped ligaments in this, in this joint. So that's normal. You know, that good. That has good range of motion, but it does come to a stop. This person, unfortunately, has been through a trauma. One girl was a basketball injury, knocked her out backwards. Uh, one was an auto accident. One was the foot in the four-wheeler. I can't remember what the other one was. But here's what's happening with this. These ligaments 
This is a ligament, okay, and this is actually the, um, the ligament that's in the body. You can see, I'm, I'm using sports tape for this. It's the way I demonstrated in court. So that's nice and tight. See, it has a, has a little bit of give, but it's not going too far. This one, we've got, we've got problems. This one's torn, okay? You see what's going on in there? And that's, when you start getting that, again, with the spinal cord there, that's very devastating. So if you hold it still and take a picture, and on x-rays and CTs, you can't see the ligament. MRIs can see ligaments, but they have to be they have to be fairly acutely injured, where there's a little bit of edema, and the, and the radiologist actually has to slice through it to say, oh, that is an abnormal ligament. If you don't do that, you're going to miss it because they can only slice so many slices, and if they're not keyed in on something, and they can do it if you tell them, hey, uh, get that um, uh, interspinous ligament and look at the interspinous ligament. I think it's something wrong with it. Then the radiologist can, hey, let's cut really tiny right through that ligament. Oh yeah, that is a little inflamed in there. It has some edema. It probably is torn. So. Other than that, you're not going to see it. So we have we have an X-ray, CT scan, MRI. They say there's no bulging disc, there's no rupture disc. This person's crazy. That's what all four girls got told. So they 16, 17, 18, and up to 19. They were all and so they had they were severely disabled. They finally got to the point where doctors were telling them they were hysterical. They were girls and snapped out of it. You know, you waste enough of your money, your parents' money. You put we've got enough tests. Everything's negative. There's nothing wrong with you. And they have devastating injuries. So it's, it's kind of a missing link, the DMX is. So when I get to court, we say, you can't see this unless you move it. Now, if you put this in motion, it's very clear. Now, this thing is broken. It's busted. But you can't see it on an x-ray. You can't see it on a CT. You start, you start moving it on. on uh, now, the DMX, what we'll do, we'll do a side shot, and we'll have the patient go up and down. We'll have them from the front shot. We'll have them go back and forth. So we can see all these joints moving. So this is abnormal, really abnormal. Now, if that keeps going far enough, that is going to, the, the patient will expire. You know, if it does that, that's a hangman's fracture right there. If you do that. So anyway, these, these, are, these are the things that we've really, um, uh, really enjoyed having this DMX technology. I accidentally ran into it about 20 years ago in Florida, at a, at a Florida convention. Um, and I'm glad the guy showed it to me. It's a, it's a very expensive machine. It's $100,000. So most private doctors won't get that. But I went to the bank and I said, look, I think this is going to be a very important we got it. it it's, it's been wonderful. There's a, and there's other minor injuries that we can pick up with this too, just little tiny slips of ligaments. But there's no other way to prove that they're damaged without that uh, information. But the, uh, the, the, the treatment for these injuries are not my treatment. My, I send these people to neurosurgeons, very specialized neurosurgeons, one in particular, Dr. Frank, uh, Joel Frank, and he's now in Tampa, Florida. And he comes in and he actually uh, has these, they're called, they're called um, lag screws. You know what a lag screw is? Uh, it, 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 the, the more you put it in, the tighter it makes something. Uh, has, it has, I think it has threads just on the, on the very tip, and then it pulls everything else together. So he gets a lag screw, of course, some, uh, uh, a surgical lag screw. He goes through here, and it goes into C1. It plants into C1, and so as he tightens here, these things come together, and they completely, they, they become one body, and they don't move anymore. So he gets rid of this. Okay. And every one of these girls, no instantly, no, no seizures. One had a headache for like a week, and then none since then. Um, some of these are, I think, 10 years old now. They, they go to school, they've got the college degree, they're all working. They're, they're married, they're normal human beings again. But this is, this is just, we don't have much of them, thank goodness. It's a, it's a rare entry. But we've had four of these girls, and then we've had 10 adults have had this and had to have the same surgery. Uh, lag screw particular uh, fixation. So that's that's something that we've been very helpful for in the community, which is uh, I'm glad to have that technology there. Now I've given you a lot of information, um, getting some questions about uh, chiropractic care or, or the uh, uh, chiropractic physicians. Something you guys have a question about? Would a doctor um, refer them to you because you have that machine? Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of doctor referrals. Um, the fact the Seminar that I go to to keep up my, my information with the digital motion x-ray, and it's a fluoroscopy machine. Now, every hospital has fluoroscopy, but this is a high-speed fluoroscopy. That means uh, if you go to a regular um, fluoroscopy unit in the hospital, the radiology hospital, they usually use it for intestine. They, they, you drink this contrast junk, and then they follow it all the way down. You know, and as, as they turn you, move you, they might tip you up on a table and tip you down. They, they see the outline of the intestines. That's what it's used for. But it's very slow. Um, if you try, if, if they move them too fast, everything gets blurry. 
You remember the old TVs when, when before HD? And when the football players would run, they would be like watercolors, they'd be blurry, and they'd stop, and they'd come back into focus again. That's kind of what the general fluoroscopy is. The um, doctor that invented this, and actually was a chiropractor, he was a, he was a, a, a mechanical engineer from chiropractic college, he liked to do these injuries from auto accidents. He got frustrated because he'd send people to the hospital to do the fluoroscopy, and it was always blurry. The definition was really bad. Um, so he designed this. It's FDA approved and everything. It's been sold for about 20 years. And so it's high speed. So when you move, if you're, if you're looking to evaluate a, a joint like an elbow, you can move this speed and it stays in perfect focus. You can even, if you get a bit closer to the, the transponder, you can actually blow it up so it's really big. You can see this thing's really big moving. But it, it, it has 30 frames a second, so it catches that fast motion. So that's, that's what the key is on, on getting these things diagnosed. But yeah, medical doctors, uh, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, this seminar, um, I don't tell my patients this because I want them to feel sorry for me when I go on to go to conference after a seminar. It's in the Grand Cayman, and uh, it has been the whole for I've been 18 years now. And there's doctors from all over the world: Australia, Belgium, uh, France, Germany, the Netherlands, um, uh, where else? Canada, America. And these are orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, all to do with spine. Everybody has a spine doctor there. Uh, chiropractors, uh, radiologists. There's a tech, there's a radiologist. Uh, that's called an interventionalist radiologist. Those are usually the chief radiologist. And that means they can actually do surgery. They, they, they do surgery under a scope of like a CT scan or a fluoroscopy. Uh, so if someone needs something done in the brain, they can actually look at the MRI and send in uh, tubes into the brain to the clot and they can spray kind of like this, like a hose that has all these sprinklers. They can, they can get right to the clot and spray um, uh, some kind of a blood thinner to dissolve the clot. You know, so they, they're a very specialized type. Uh, doctor, we have, the one that we have now, he came to see me in my office two years ago, and um, he's the chief radiologist um, that's taken over the Riverview. The radiology has been subcontracted to St. Vincent's, so, and his name is Jonathan Walter. He's the head of all the St. Vincent's radiologists. He's the chief interventionalist, uh, ortho interventionalist radiologist. And he came over and he said, how come you're not doing MRIs? You know, you do, I know you do a lot of MRIs because you see a lot of discs, and we don't get any orders from you. I said, well, there's so many people asking me for their business. You know, they'll come and give us cookies. They'll give my staff cookies at Christmas and thank you. Little gifts through the year. Please refer to us, you know, like the advanced imaging and the one in Rainbow City. But I said, so we really have a need you. No one's to come from Ruby. He, well, he says, look, let me take you in. He took me in. He showed me around. He said, look, we're redoing everything here. You know, this is all up to uh, uh, St. Vincent standards. And I was just blown away, really impressed. So we've used him a lot. Uh, used he, he comes down twice a uh, month, I mean twice a week from Birmingham, or comes up. Uh, but I have him on my text, so he's been a great contact. So if I have an x-ray, and I've used him quite a bit now, um, I have a, uh, I'll have an x-ray that I see a mass on or something that's not right, I'll take a picture, I'll say, uh, hey, Dr. Jonathan, what do you think about this? He says, he says no, that's just a bone eye, and that's, that's benign, don't worry about it. I said, okay, do another one. He goes, that's worrisome, we need a CT like right now. So he's been really good, you know, for, for getting being able to, to get these people out. One man that we had two months ago, old man, came in, I had back pain, real high level back pain, like 10 out of 10 back pain. Uh, I said, hey, I got back pain, I heard you could help me. He said, well, we don't know until we do our, our, our whole exam and our triage and our x-ray. So I did everything, I said, yeah, you're pretty tender back there. Let's get x-rays, we did x-rays. He goes home, I build my x-rays at night for, to get ready for him the next day. And I see on his lateral x-ray, he has a, the largest abdominal aneurysm I've ever seen. There's a main artery that comes out of your heart, goes down straight through your body, and then all the sprinkler systems come off of it. It's the main artery that feeds your whole entire body. It goes down the descending aorta, that's what it's called. And it goes down and gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally it splits off right the groin into your two main arteries going to your legs, the, the uh, iliac and femoral arteries. So but as it as got down here, it's supposed to be this big. It was that big. It was the size of a small basketball. And it was so big I didn't believe it. So I, I took several pictures of it, inverted the contrast, sent it to Jonathan, and I said, am I looking at, I think it was like a 93. If, if, they, if they start getting over 30, they start getting worried about they do ultrasound. And it was, a, it was 94. I said, am I looking at 94? sized aneurysm and he gets back real quick he says he says is this guy in your office and I said no 
and we're texting on this, and he said, he said, find out where he is, get the name what's out there, and give him a river view. I'll call down there and get all this, I'll get everything set up for you. So I said, I said, great. He said, he said we're looking at an aneurysm. He says, yeah, this guy probably will die tonight. And, um, this, is, this is an emergency to the highest degree. So I called his friend who had brought him in and said, can you get him to the hospital? I sure can. Get him right there, go to Riverview, just go in and tell him that Dr. Jones has sent you. He's already set up with Dr. Jonathan. So anyway, they got him in. Actually, they, um, they saw what they, that he had and they sent him, I think they sent him to Birmingham, you know, uh, by ambulance. Um, and they did the repair that night. And, and they, they, they cut out that big aneurysm and they reconnected with the tube, a little uh, artificial tube in here. But he lived through it. He, he was old, I think he was like 88 or something like that. Wow. But he lived through it. But that's, it's, it's so good to have doctors communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but for my generation, there was a real battle between medical doctors and chiropractors. They were always battling each other. That came from, um, uh, chiropractic started in 1895. The first chiropractor was another type of a doctor. He noticed that his janitor, his black janitor in, in uh, Iowa, um, uh, he was in his building. And he, the guy was deaf, and so he, he was interested in the bumps of the back, you know, all these bumps. He was always looking at them, saying, what can I do? Is there something here that I can fix? And he told the guy to come over, and he felt, and he felt this huge bone out of place. And so he just did some kind of a move, pow, heard a pop. Didn't know if he killed him or what. And the guy got up, and he, he said, he couldn't speak because he was deaf from birth. He went, oh, 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 oh. He's like, oh, oh, so he could hear. And so he goes, and so he said, wow, what's going on? That's what started chiropractic. It was a deaf guy that, that um, the guy is hearing that because of the C2 adjustment. But, and then he started building on to that. 1895, do you guys know anything about 1895? It's a very interesting year. Uh, a lot of incredi incredible scientific, almost miracles became evident. Um, that's when x-ray was discovered. And Dr. Rinkin, um, uh, Rinkinology is the old name for x-rays, Rinkinology or Rinkograph, now it's, now it's x-ray. He had noticed in 1895, he had this stuff over here, which was radioactive. Uh, he had photographic film on this side of this laboratory, and he had a bunch of pencils and pens here, and he was doing notes and everything, and then he, and he um, uh, I, I think he tried to take a picture or something, he went and he photographed it, and it was a, it was a, black, it was a black shadow image of the, of the uh, pencils and pens. He goes, well, how did that get there? And he, little by little, he figured out this source from this thing uh, is now making some kind of a light ray that we can't see, and it's actually going in and changing the silver on the photographic plate. And that's how I've came about. You know, you ever seen the doctor hold up the film? All that is is, is different grades of silver, you know, that is either oxidized or not. I wonder what the X-ray gets. So he says, well, I don't know what this ray's called. It's not infrared. Uh, it's not white light. It's not, it's not uh, this, that, and the other. I'll just put, you know, X marks. In math, X is the unknown. So he put, this is the X-ray. We'll name it later. And it never got changed. That's how X-ray got its name. Oh. So they never gave it a name. Mm -hmm. that, so. mm -hmm. But anyway, the chiropractor was the first to use them because this guy was out there. He knew about X-ray. He said, I want to see the bones from the inside. So he started X-ray. They started getting X-ray machines going. So they X -ray, the chiropractor were X-raying uh, patients before medical doctors were X-raying. And they could see the bones. Um, and they were making some, some conclusions, which I don't think are really right now. But they would start popping these joints and people would start getting help from different types of conditions. Chiropractors can't help everything, but we can help some things, and the things that we help are really good at. Um, that's why we give them triage these patients, like the guy with the aneurysm, the, the little girls that had that bad injury here, I can't help them. I just have to triage them and give them to the correct doctor. Um, but anyway, so as they started going through, they started seeing all these, look, it sounded like miracles. Um, and they're really not just the way the body's hooked up neurologically. If I come up to somebody and I'm, I'm going through here and I feel some tenderness right there at T5, T6, I'll say, do you have heartburn? They go, yeah, doc, not kids, that's usually adults. Yeah, doc, how do you know that? Are you a, a mind reader? And I said, no, that's T5, T6. Those nerves go internally to the gastric uh, acid pumps. And they go, well, yeah, I take, uh, I take a medicine every day for it. Uh, I say, and I said, okay, well, let's adjust that. I adjust it, and then I come back and go, you know, I didn't have to take my medicine for a week. What do you do? And it's not, there's nothing magic to it, it's just that's where the nerves go. The nerves C2 go to the, they communicate to the inner ear. They don't go directly there, but they communicate to the inner ear. So if someone comes in and they're dizzy, it's like, you know, I've gone to my medical doctor and I've taken all these pills and I, I can't stand up, I'm getting sick. So I say, if there's a C2 there, we can help you. So we check them. Most of them have C2s. It's rare to find someone who has, uh, not syncope, but uh, has 
vertigo without a C2. So I'll check C2, I'll, I'll adjust it with my other instruments, advanced, advanced portion of that. I'll adjust it and they'll go, wow, that feels better. Let's come back another couple times this week. You adjust it maybe two or three times and they go, ah, it's gone. So again, that's not magic. In the older days, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, chiropractors would get really cocky, you know, because it's like, we can cure cancer, we can cure everything. That wasn't right because they can't. Um, but they just, they have, saw so many people that medicine gave up on, they do some adjustments and the person as well. You know, the, the, the guy with the limp leg, like a little dog, you know, he did some, you know, the doctor said there's nothing they can do for it. This is before MRI, you know, really before back surgery. And they said, well, let's do this. They'll crack their back and they go, my leg feels better. They do a couple of them, and they're like, well, that doctor told me I'd never walk again. Look at what I have got on the formium. So the chiropractors got a little cocky, and they start saying they could cure everything, and then the MDs got real mad at them and said, I don't know what you guys are. Uh, we're going to call you quacks for the time being. Nerves can't get pinched at the spine, because if you do this, you would pinch all your nerves. And so we know that's bogus. Actually, the chiropractors were right, and they didn't, they didn't accept that until we came out with the MRI. The MRI can actually show a, a nerve getting pinched. It's not, it's not typically the bone that's doing it, it's the disc. But when you relieve the, 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 when you relieve the joint pressure, and you can get this joint to move and, and decompress, then the pressure comes off, the nerve heals. So both were wrong and both were right. But in the 70s, uh, some chiropractors finally got fed up with it, so we're suing the AMA. They're, they're, they're actually putting out textbooks with false information, which they did. They're putting them in the libraries. Chiropractors kill people, cause strokes, um, cripple little children. It was really horrible, and it was all fake. It looked like it looked like official textbooks. I mean, references and everything. So the um, these group of chiropractors went to the Supreme Court of Illinois, uh, took it all the way there, and they had all the chiropractors go into the libraries and take these books out and just pay the fine and keep them. They brought them in the court because the MD said we never have done that. It wasn't. It was a. It was a uh, form of the AMA. It, it was called the Anti Quackery Division. And they just had labeled chiropractors as quacks. So they, they, they started going into the libraries to try to find these books so they can burn them and keep them out of court. They showed up, the chiropractors won, and they said, all we want is you to change your protocol. Yes, we can get chiropractic referrals, and yes, we can refer to chiropractors. That's all they wanted, and they want it. And so from that point on, and the MRI, uh, and better education with chiropractors. Like I said, now it's, like a, it's a medical uh, uh, um, curriculum. So uh, now we're up to speed where we know where our field is. MDs are getting, the new MDs, all these MDs that come into the office now are all young. You know, they're out of school. Well, they're, they're not young because they've gone through so much school. But they're, they're newly in their field. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Dusty, um, let's talk about Dusty's name. Dr. Dusty Smith, an orthopedic surgeon. He came into my office again about two years ago and said, I want to meet you. Uh, my patients keep talking about you. I need a chiropractor to work with. I'm a spine doctor. Uh, ten people that have ruptured discs that come into my office, eight will need you, only two will be really protocol for surgery. And so I said, yeah, I'll look around. So we've been real, real, really good friends. He's really advanced. He's the most advanced doctor we've had here. In fact, he's so advanced that he ran, ran off a neurosurgeon has been here forever. Is he in a He is now with Dr. Sparks. He was with uh, the Gadsden group. Uh, they dissolved, and now he, the Sparks have brought yeah. him in, Dr. Dusty Smith. He's going to be their spine surgeon. Okay. He's absolutely excellent. Um, I haven't sent anybody for spines to, or I haven't referred anybody to a spine surgeon here in town for about 25 years until Dr. Dusty came. And then Sunday was over to Birmingham. We have a whole bunch of great surgeons down there. But, um, you know, he's good. And then a, a plastic surgeon came in, um, and he's, he's been here two years. Um, and Dr. Meyer, his name's Dr. Meyer, Rob Meyer, Robert Meyer. And Dr. Rumley, does anybody know Dr. Rumley? He's been here forever and ever. He retired. He was a plastic surgeon. Uh, he retired. And um, we, we refer quite a few people for different things. Sometimes we'll find uh, lipomas on people's back. They're pretty common, especially men. You know what lipoma is? It's a little fatty tumor. It's very common. You'll probably have one eventually. You look pretty young, but you'll probably eventually have one. And that's a plastic surgeon's thing. Um, uh, trigger fingers, you know, these fingers that get locked into place, duty trends, contractions, what it's called, this, this tendon will get, just over time, start getting scar tissue, and then pretty soon they can't move the finger. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, that's a neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, that's a plastic surgeon, should do that. Orthopedists, we don't refer to them for that. Mm -hmm. People come in with injured shoulders, I, I tell them, if it's a joint only, I'm going to be able to help it. If it's a, a rotator cuff muscle, I can't do anything for it, got to see orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. So we'll work out for a little while, if it's not any better, 
we refer them out. So we have a real good referral source between uh, most of the MDs in town. They, they know who I am. They know that I stay in my scope of practice and I refer out anything that, that I know that I've diagnosed that can't, I can't help. And that's the way it really should work. You know, all doctors should do that. But that's, that's a really good question. Because in the old days it wasn't like that. Right. Before my generation, they were, they were just enemies. You know? uh, MDs called chiropractors quacks and the chiropractor said, you don't need any medicine at all, which is that's not true. Yeah. Um, is I've got two questions. One is there another branch in the medical field that went through the same um, trouble with anti-quackery that you could say has changed or tell us about? In the medical field, um, a lot a lot of them have a lot of uh, anything that was alternative that wasn't in the scope of the AMA, the the big um, uh, American uh, Medical Association. If you're not connected to them, they kind of want to protect their own. You know, they don't want about treating patients in America because that's what they're supposed to be for. There have been some, I don't know the specifics, I thought you were going to ask about um, uh, DOs, which are um, doctors of, of uh, osteopathic medicine. Now they train in manipulation like we do and they do medical field, they do medical too. So they're a medical doctor or the chiropractor put together. They're called DOs. You've been treated by them, you've seen them. Some are surgeons, some are anesthesiologists, some are general practitioners. And you never know it until you look at a thing and it says, you know, it says uh, Dr. Smith DO. You know, or, or Dr. Uh, Dr. Wilson D.O. It's like, oh, they're, they're working with doctors. You wouldn't know them from a medical doctor. I, we get a lot of referrals from them because they're used to manipulation and they don't do a lot of it. Uh, they usually, most of them gravitate towards medicine and so they go, you know, oh, you got a cricket, I just go see Dr. Jones. You know, he, he can do that better than I can. But, um, uh, uh, but as far as a specific group, I don't know. Did you think of, were you thinking of something? I was just thinking of different other branches, other alternative branches. That has come under that same scrutiny of almost anything that's out of out of uh, mainstream medicine. However, um, that's changing quite a bit. Again, the younger MDs coming out of school, they don't have that prejudice that hey, we we're, we're the only way, the only answer. Plus, there's so many foreign medical doctors. Um, if you've noticed, you know, they they come from uh, India, uh, Chinese doctors, um, Korean. They come here and they bring a completely different aspect or concept of medicine. To them, they'll use anything uh, that, that they see as scientific, um, whether it's mixing up, you know, green tea and doing three of those a day, you know, or going to a chiropractor, or maybe you have to have surgery, you have to have a cortisone injection. They use it all, and they're very they they do that in their country. They don't have any of this anti-chiropractic, anti-MD uh, relationship. They don't know anything about it at all. And so that's as they're coming in, they're they're. In the medical field is much more open to natural things now than they've ever been before. Um, for, again, 31 years I've been here, I've encouraged people to take supplements, vitamins, you know, vitamin D, especially, especially the women, to get that you know, calcium into the bones. And um, a lot of women will come back and say, oh, my doctor said it's just, you know, just making expensive urine. You're just drinking, it's going right out through your urine. I said, well, if the supplement is getting into your urine, which is filtration through your blood, that means it's got into your blood, and that's what we want to do anyway. But now, last 10 years, every female patient that is that it's from their 30s on up, hey, Dr. Jones, just want to let you know, my medical doctor checked my vitamin D, and, and he put me on 6,000 units a day. I was super, super low on develop osteoporosis. So that almost every female is on vitamin D from their, from their medical doctor. So that's a big change. Um, the uh, I take um, fish oil every day. Uh, I've played too much soccer, and my, my knees are pretty beat up, and meniscus are beat up. It's kind of like the pads here. That's normal. Mine are probably like that. Um, so I take fish oil, and I don't, I don't have any pain as long as I take fish oil. And that is recognized now with the medical profession as being a natural anti-inflammatory, very effective. So much so, if you have to have surgery, you have to get off, for seven days, you have to get off uh, fish oil along with all your other medications because you, they, they don't want your blood to be thin if they do surgery or an epidural injection. So it's, it's very well recognized. It keeps me out of pain. And the side effect of fish oil, it's an anti-inflammatory, it thins your blood. The side effect is it protects your heart from heart disease. So it, it does the opposite of what a synthetic does on that. Do so. you, you have any questions? Yes? Um, is L5 a bone in your spine? It is. L5, L5 is, and the way this is structured is um, the skull is here. Seven of the first bones are cervical. Those are the C's. It just stands for cervical. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are thoracics. We call them T's. Uh, I just talked about with him, I, I touched T5 and T6. Uh, 
um, on that. And then the last five bones of the spine are the lumbars. Exactly right. So we start up here, one, two, three, four, five is the last one down here. Okay. And, and that's the one, if I turn around, you can see the discs. Um, that's, the, that's the L5-S1 disc. That's the L4-L5 <coughs> disc. Discs don't have numbers to them. You just call them by the vertebrates above and below them. That way, if I uh, was sending someone out to California, I said, they've got a blown out L5 disc. It's like, well, L5 disc here or the one on top of L5. So if I say L5-S1, the doctor knows it's that, it's that one. It's the one sanction to point. So, yeah, do you know someone's had some trouble with that? Or? Yeah, my friend had a bulging disc in L5. Bulging, and did he get it repaired? He did. It fixed? Okay, good. Yeah, a young kid like you or older? He was 16. Yeah, it's a, a little unusual, but you can get them with trauma. Um, people my age, patients my age, uh, they've had some minor trauma, or it wasn't minor, because in, in, as years go by, decades go by, it gets worse and worse and worse. But most of the patients my age, um, they've had an injury maybe 40 years ago, and, and they're young, they can bounce out of it, you know, they, they, the body adapts well. But over the years, it dries out this decade, that decade, and now they're here, and they come in. I said, well, you've really beat up your lower back. You had a pretty bad injury there. I've had no injuries in my lower back. I said, well, what happened 40 years ago? Oh, that long ago? Oh, yeah, I fell out of a tree and landed on my back. I said, that's it. You know, you can, you can, almost, you can almost look at them and read them like the uh, rings of a tree. You can, you can get pretty, I can get pretty close. I mean, within a 10-year plus or minus. But can you avoid that happening? Get with chiropractic care, yes. Nothing else will do it. Anti-inflammatories won't stop that. Uh, it'll, it'll, Anti-inflammatories will stop the inflammation there, but it won't stop the drying out. Except with chiropractic care, we can slow it down and stop it in some situations. Um, if you're at this stage, that's a great stage because we can, we can keep that from advancing. This stage, we're going to slow that down. People, I have a lot of seniors that come in on Medicare and they have several levels like this in their neck and their lower back. And I can't restore that disc anymore because it's basically dried up. It's gone. But we can still get our instrument, get in here and adjust them, and open up those joints and keep these joints moving. Okay. Once I get motion there, that actually helps the joint um, circulate. The, the reason that's so powerful is because the joint is, uh, it's not just a dry bone like that. It has a capsule around it. It's got fluid inside of it. And it's got, a, it's got a living nutrients flowing in and out if it moves. So... A joint, if it doesn't move, it can't pump nutrients in and waste products out. So if I put this in a cast for like six years, took off the cast, that joint would be ruined. I, I probably never, I, it would never be normal again because it's starved to death. If, if, if you, um, someone's sleeping and you take their elbow and you have your elbow again, you're a good demonstration. You uh, close your eyes like you're asleeping. If I, okay, no, let this thing go. If I do this, that joint is now getting circulation. But if he's, if it's like that, it's not. He wakes up, you know, you wake up and it's like, oh, man, the first thing you want to do is move and twist because your joints are saying, we are thirsty, we are hungry, we've got all this junk built up in us, and the way you get it out is with motion. Motion, motion pumps, it's a pumping action that pumps out the bad stuff. That leaves a, a vacuum where the nutrients can then suck in with osmosis. But you have to have motion. Um, different than the muscles, because muscles don't. So this muscle here, when he's asleep, um, there's, there's nutrients coming in and there's waste products flowing out all the time because it's got arteries coming in and veins going out. So muscles aren't like that. They can get fed even if you're not moving. Um, joints, they can. So the, the real key to chiropractic care is find joints that are stuck. And, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of my patients, I'll just say it's like a joint, it's like a jam finger. Same exact joint. It's called a synovial joint. Those are synovial joints. And you catch a basketball wrong, it's like, ah, you know, it's puffy, it hurts, it's hot. Uh, when, I, when I push down on the patient winces and it's not moving, and if we don't fix it, that's, that joint's going to uh, ankylose, mm -hmm. which is what this is. This is where the bones have grown together. It's called ankylosing. So um, we will get the instrument. In fact, if it is a finger, we'll get this instrument, and we'll start working and getting that, all the, 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 the uh, adhesions out of there, where it's making it tight, and pretty soon it'll start moving, and then I get my function back. And once the function gets back, the body itself will do the healing with the circulation. So that's that's the big key. That's what Dr. Palmer found out when he started adjusting these people back in 18, 1895. Mm -hmm. You know, he, people were getting well and feeling so much better because they were moving again on that. So but yeah, that was a good question too. Any other questions? You mentioned heartburn and vertigo. Besides pain, what else? And ear, ear infections. Besides pain, what else are some of the ailments? 
of, of uh, what we can, what we work on, or what would be in our field. Numbness and tingling. Uh, that's a big one. People come in and go, I think I got carpal tunnel, but I got because I got numbness and tingling in my hand. Well, let's check it. Nope, the tenel sign is, is negative, so it's not there. We, we do the, uh, the the brachial area. It's not there. Oh, oh, that hurts, Doc. It's it there. It's the problem. It's the nerve root. And the way to oh, I'm sweating. The way uh, the the nerves are are uh, anatomically uh, um, uh, named is the the root. Like the thing about this is a tree. This is the root. This is the branch. Uh, this is the uh, trunk. Root, trunk, branches are up here. So if I raise my hand like a like a tree, we have root trunk and branches to the nerve. So a carpal tunnel is the median nerve that runs right through there. That's the carpal tunnel right under there. The median nerve is the branch of this nerve up here in the neck. So the root is here. We Almost everything we deal with is going to be nerve root, which is connected to the spine. So see these guys coming out of here? That's the, just inside that bone would be the nerve root. Okay, And when the nerve root gets pinched, it's kind of like if you look at a oak tree and you cut a root here, you see the branches die way up there, so it's a, kind of the same thing. So nuns and tingling, big deal. Feet tingling, uh, hand or fingers tingling. We're going to look to here. If we find the problem here, we tell the patient we're probably going to be able to help them. Uh, if it's just a carpal tunnel, we have adjustments for that, um, and we're usually pretty good with that. If, if not, we go out to a surgeon. Um, and again, plastic surgeon on that. Um, weakness is one, like my dog had the, the leg that was paralyzed. Turned out the vet agreed with me uh, that it was neurological. It wasn't it no fever. It wasn't infection. The, lymph, the lymphatics felt good. She didn't have any kind of loose ligaments. There was nothing on her paw making her put her, bring her head. So uh, we figured that was neurological. Uh, and that's weakness. And it, sometimes it's as subtle as people come in and they're, they're just stumbling on a foot for no reason. There's nothing there. They do it over and over for weeks. So we have tests that we do. If we find that, then we're going to be working here at L5, L4. Um, of, of these particular vertebrae. And if, again, if they don't respond quickly, we do an MRI, and then we, we will see um, we will see that. You know, We'll do some more treatments, make sure they clear out. Most of them do. The ones that don't, we do epidural injections. We send them out for that. I, I don't do them, of course. Um, and then if they fail that, we send them to a surgeon that we really like, and then they have surgery on that. Um, headaches is a big one. Of course, that's kind of in the pain zone. Blurry vision, um, again, the Business, like we said on that, heartburn, constipation. I have a lot of patients that come in um, with constipation, and uh, babies, uh, toddlers, teenagers, adults, seniors. It really doesn't matter. It's always the L2, and L2. Put this up over here. L2 uh, is. Let's do this. Five, four, three, two is here. So the L2, I'll adjust that vertebrae because the nerves they go there now. There's, there's different branches of nerves, not, get, not to be too complicated. This is only showing the spinal nerves. These are the ones that run down your leg, down your arm, things like that. But there's, there's a branch that comes around here and connects to the autonomic nervous system. Those are the ones that go to the colon, and they pretty much control the, the colon. If the colon's overstimulated, it's, it's going too fast, you have diarrhea. If it's sluggish and it's not getting enough electrical energy to the colon muscles, it goes slow and you got constipation. Um, and all constipation is the, the, the colon is, is the last part of the digestive system. The small intestine is bacteria breaking things down, getting the good stuff out of it, getting and making uh, vitamins and stuff. Once it's done with that, it's extracted all the good stuff out, uh, then it's just it's, it's a real soupy juice. So it goes into the colon, which is the large intestine, and it's a vacuum. It's a, it's a water vac. And all it does is, the, as the material moves through, it sucks the water out and puts it back into the blood so you don't dehydrate. You know, and as you go through it gets it gets it gets stickier and stickier more like clay until we're done with it. So if that process is going too slow, it, it dries out, it becomes too dry, and it stops, it can't slide anymore. So L2 is what we adjust on that. And then there's a there's actually a reflex uh, point. Um, we go to the, the it's always on the left side, no matter if it's a baby, a senior, it's the it's the left side of L2 is right about here. And I'll, it hurts. I'll, I'll go into that. Babies cry. You know, teenagers almost cry. Adults say, "What are you doing? Are you killing me?" And I'll, I'll do a, I'll do a little bit of a reflex on that, and then boom, we're done. And that usually clears everybody out. We've, had, I think, I've had one person in 30 years that said that didn't help. You know, and sometimes I have to do it two or three times. But I've had one person that said that didn't help. You know, if they would tell me the truth on that. Um, let's see what else. Um, sometimes some colicky with babies. 
Um, some breathing, some um, uh, asthma, if someone comes in and I see a T3, let me see your spine again, but a T3 is right up here, and the autonomic nerves, again, the nerves that come around here, go to the bronchial tubes. And in terms of bronchial tubes, if they're stimulated, they'll be tight and constricted. If they're inhibited, if the inhibited nerve hits them, then they'll dilate, which is what you want. You want big, open bronchial tubes, good pipes for air to go down. And so I'll, I'll, I'll check that, and it's very tender. I'll say, do you have any asthma? No, 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 the asthma. Well, do you have the uh, daily, are you having a... <clears throat> You know, cough up a lot to get your breath. Yeah, I do that all the time. It's like a nervous habit. So well, that's probably what's happening here. The bronchial tubes are narrow. Therefore, the, the, the material, the mucus that comes out of the lungs, has to come through there, you know, so it can be swallowed. And it comes through there, and if it's that way, just a little bit of mucus gets it, gets it clogged. They have to cough it up. And then we adjust them, and it opens them up. And then they can, they can take bigger breaths. Now, that's not everybody. I have people come in and they say, my neighbor said, you can cure my child's asthma. I said, not necessarily. Only if it's a spinal problem. If it's, from, if it's intrinsic to the actual lungs, I can't. That's not, my, that's not my field. But let's check T3 and see. No, you know, T3 is perfectly fine. Nothing to adjust. This is not for me to take on. But if it is tender there, I said, yeah, let's, let's start working on your child's asthma. So you really have, that's where you really have to you know, use your protocol and your triaging uh, to make sure. I don't want to waste patients' time and money you know, treating something that, that I can't help them in the first place. doesn't do my reputation any good on that. Um, Chrissy, let me see. What else do we do? Uh, uh, sometimes blurry vision. You said, yeah, I have a question yeah. on that. Blurry vision as in both eyes, or does it matter? It, it can be one. Eye? Yeah, it can be one or it can be both. And again, it's not, a lot of things cause blurry vision. Tiredness, age, you know, prescriptions that need to be updated. Um, the, we'll, we'll get this a lot with head trauma blurry vision, so sometimes a cross-eyed vision, but it's usually head trauma like we were talking about with these. It doesn't have to be that severe, but um, but not all uh, blurriness is, is going to be in that realm, but uh, sometimes I have people, I'll adjust, they never told me, I'll just see one, it's, it's always see one for the eyes, and I'll just see one for headache or something, they go, could any of this have anything to do with my, my eyes clearing up, Dr. Jones, because I, I can see better now, I don't have to use my glasses. I said, yeah, I can, because we've been adjusting C1. A lot of times it's after the fact, people don't think to even tell me that. Um, let me see. I think covered. I covered the the, the majority of things. That do we you did. have a chart that has a listing of those on there? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a chart at the office. I don't have it with me though. But I do have a chart at the office that has that on there. So um, the again the techniques that we talked that I'm doing um, is a little bit more advanced. Um, the general chiropractor uses a Thompson table, which is a, a, even adjusted on a Thompson table. It's a low table, has different uh, areas that, that, that fall out on it. Um, the, that's the most common chiropractic technique. We have to master, I think, the top 30 techniques before we get out of school to get our license, to get our degree, I should say. But the Thompson technique is a table that has a lumbar section, and it drops about that far. Okay? Uh, and then we've got a thoracic, upper thoracic, neck, and then head. And there's a little, there's a little uh, pedal that they step on, and just kind of an air thing goes, whoop, pops up, and they go, pow, and then they pop up the other one, pow. What they're doing, it's, it's uh, they're able to get a little bit of a, a rundown, and then it gives a little more force at a quicker. It's trying to speed up the quickness of the delivery. Um, and the developer of these kind of figured that out. So he, he uh, made an uh, instrument to get a fire much, much faster than, than a human um, can, can fire. I think, I think it's one... 300 of a second or something like that. Um, the instrument, the advanced instrument I use that's now all computer run, um, it fires at a much faster rate and it, it actually reads the spine. It, it has a accelerometer, it'll, it'll adjust, get kicked back, that information will go back into the computer. The computer then say, oh, I'm going to now adjust that to 4 hertz. It hits again, comes back, let's go to 12 hertz, boom. So it's somewhere between 4 and 12 hertz, we're going to get the, we're going to get the, the what we call resonance, where, where we actually the, the instrument is moving, the joint, the joint's moving with it. Once it feels that, it'll, it'll turn itself off. It'll beat and turn itself off. So it's, it's a, a smart machine on that. Did that answer your question? The, the I, answer? I just heard about vision, it helping with vision. I do have a blurry, like a stigmatism in one eye. And it would have to, would have, on, on, there's, on the exam, there's no real way on the exam to tell you. Like, if someone comes in with headaches, and I feel a C1 shifted to the left, I'm going to tell them 9% chance we're going to take care of your headache. With blurry vision, there's no one test I can do. We usually just have to do a series of treatments. We do like six treatments. How you feel now? Oh, my eyes, but good. Then we'll put you on once a month. Or didn't do any good at all. 
then we, right. and then we won't go any further on that. But that's that's kind of what, what it leads into. Um, um, it's not it's not as clear cut as these things like you know. Right. Uh, I've just heard about it before, so curious to know. Yeah, just to, and it'd be case by case basis on that. Yeah. So, anybody else have any more questions? I go over my time. You're beautiful. Okay, good. Right in the middle of it. Okay, good, good. Any questions? You're quiet. You've never been to a chiropractor, right? No. You've got to have some questions. Like, do they jump off of, uh, do they swing from a chandelier and jump on your back? What do you think that? Yeah. What do you think about yoga? I love yoga. That just, that goes with the, um, that, that kind of stretching is just so good for the, the joints and the ligaments, too. It helps keep the ligaments in good shape. It's slow. It's not anything, I'm, I'm not, the, the boot camps uh, are a little bit rough on the body. Yeah. You know, is it true that. for alignment? Well, it'll help my it'll help me keep the patient in line more. Any, any kind of, anything you're doing for the core uh, muscles, those patients always need less treatments than my patients that don't do that. Mm -hmm. On that, um, and I, I my uh, spiritual beliefs, I don't get into the spiritual side of yoga. Just the, just the exercise uh, part of yoga is it's real good for you. On that, as some other things are too. But, um, but those the my patients that, that go to the gym, work out, stay in good shape. Um, you know, eat good. They're, they always do better and, and need yeah. less treatments. Yes, than, than the other patients. And, and, and they get injuries there too. Yes, they do. Especially they do. the ones that do the hardcore stuff. Yeah, the, the, the boot, the boot. Uh, what's it called? Boot camp in the, the morning. Um, yeah. What's the other one? Yeah, CrossFit. 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 Yeah. Um, some get along with it just fine, but I do get injuries. I get injuries uh, from that that we have to treat. Because it, it, sometimes they try to do a little bit too much. So. Sometimes the um, instructor will have will be a little too aggressive. Mm -hmm. Want the class to try to push somebody a little too hard over their limit, then they then they end up hurting something. So, good question. How often um, do people come to see you that don't have anything wrong with them? Just to get like a like you know you go see your normal doctor once mm -hmm. a year. How often does someone come to see you? That's going to be once. I would recommend once a month. In other words, if someone comes in with with a let's say a disc now in their neck, that's the lower back of the disc are the two most common I have. Uh, hey, I got pain on my arm, numbs and tingling, my grip, I'm starting to drop my, my, my um, um, blow dryer, I can't hang on to it. Um, we'll check them. Hey, it looks like you've got a ruptured disc here. We can't say that without an MRI, but let's go ahead and proceed with our treatment. We do our 12, we check them again, no numbness, no tingling, we do what we have. We have a, a machine that measures grip test. Hey, your grip's back to normal again, that's good. Now come once a month to keep that in good shape, especially if you're an adult. Kids are a little bit, they can get away with a little bit more. Uh, some parents bring their kids in because they're into basketball, baseball, soccer, or gymnastics, and they want their kid checked every every uh, month on that. Um, but I do but have somebody to, that's healthy. That's healthy. That you want them to see them regularly. Yeah, I would it, um, recommend them. Yeah, probably once a month. If they're really healthy kids, they come in and they're not having anything on, they might go six weeks. But they, the kids, especially teenagers, real important because we make a lot of changes. Scoliosis is something that we were very effective with if we can catch the, these girls at a young age. It's usually real close to puberty, you know, 10, 11, or 12. If we catch them then, we have till 21. And we, but we do have to be pretty aggressive on our treatment with those because we're actually trying to change the, change the structure. Uh, but all of them have done good except the ones that dropped out of care. One girl uh, dropped out of care. Dad lost his health insurance for about two or three years. She came back. She was too far gone. And we really couldn't catch back up with her. Adults that come in with scoliosis, we're not ever, we're not going to make that straight, but we can keep from getting worse because the time and pressure and tension of life it's going to get you. It's going to keep shortening you down, shortening you down. So the adult is fixed, but I can keep them from getting worse. Young young kids, they're most they're mostly girls. Um, I, have, I think I have one male right now that I'm treating. But that's pretty rare. I think I've done three in my whole 31 years. Everyone else has been a girl. But the younger I get them, the more change I can make on them before they get to 21 on that. So, but uh, just healthy. But like I say, healthy people come in. Some people are they're, they may move to from California. They're always doing their yoga. They're doing their runs. They're eating their bean sprouts. And they're getting a chiropractic once a month the treatment. You know, if they want to come in. What do you have wrong? I have nothing wrong with me. Do you have any pain? No pain. So I'll check them, and I can still find things like, wow, that. That L2 is, is not moving. He says, yeah, it's kind of sore there. I didn't even notice it. And so there's, there's an inflammation building up in there, but the person doesn't know it because of the, the inflammation hasn't got up to the pain threshold of the patient. So inflammation starts to go, 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 go. The patient, no, I don't have any pain, I don't have any pain. Ooh, that feels kind of tight. That kind of hurts. I'm in a lot of pain. You know, so as we treat them, have them ice at home, they're fine. It's like 
Ah, good, Doc, I think you fixed my head. No pain, I'm not going to ice, I'm not going to come back anymore. I said, what about this? Ow, that hurts. It didn't hurt until you touch it. That's what we tell me. didn't hurt until you touch it. I said, well, that means there's inflammation there. So keep your ice going. You know, we're not icing for pain anymore. We're icing for inflammation. Um, I always give them the, the dental or, or, or medical analogy because they're used to that. I said, you know your doctor gives you 12 antibiotics. The sore throat's gone at about 6 or 7 antibiotics. What did they tell you to do? Do not stop the antibiotics. Take them until they're done because you can't feel the bacteria anymore. There's no signs. But there's still millions of bacteria in there. And they'll just, that's like pulling a weed out of the garden. I can't see the weed, but I didn't get the roots. And you go, a week later you come, well, there's roots, there's, there's weeds again. So that's what that's what that does. Um, and there will be people that will come in with no pain. Usually we'll find something that's a little tender on them. Fix them, you know, get them cleared, and then, then they're back out again on that. So, but most patients, like I said, with a ruptured disc, we clear them out. They have no symptoms anymore. Hey, you need to be in once a month because I know what you're, Actually, it looks like that one area at C5 looks like this, and it's pinching your sixth nerve down to your thumb and index finger. So we, that's good. That's chronic. It's got to, gravity's going to be your enemy. You got to keep that adjusted and, and stretched back out on that. So, well, I guess we're uh, finished. Unless anybody has any more questions or anything else to talk about. Is, how does the insurance compare to covering you all? Going to... Nowadays, it's, it's uh, almost every insurance company has chiropractic care in it. My predecessors, and I really would have wished we were, I wish insurance didn't cover us because I spend a lot of money on it. If I touch one patient, if you're my patient, I treat you, I, I have to have three staff to process the, the uh, documentation. Three staff just to get your thing documented and filed. Um, so they take my notes for me in the room, that's one hire. Then they'll scan it into a scanner. That'll go to another person. They have to do with it. That goes into the back insurance area. My insurance girl, which is there full time, takes those, looks at them, makes sure they're all clean, ready to go. There's nothing wrong with them. And then she'll send that to a vendor. The vendor looks at it and rechecks it and says, yeah, everything's okay with Medicare and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Everything's lined up. We have to pay that person. Then they send it to Blue Cross or Medicare, and then they send the check back. But it, it takes it's a lot of documentation. So I'd really rather us not have insurance, but I can't see a Medicare patient. They're a federal patient. It's a fed, they're, they're covered by federal law. I can't treat them for free, and if I treat them, I've got to document them to the nth degree. It's, a, it's amazing how complicated it's gotten now with, with Obamacare. Our, our documentation went from our, what we learned in medical school to now Yahoo does all this government documentation. So, um, but most insurance pays on this. Uh, there's a few that don't. Um, it's, everybody's different, and I don't even handle that. I don't even know what my charges are. I, I hire my staff to do that. People ask me all the time, well, if I do this treatment, this uh, interferential on my neck, this therapy, how much is it going to cost? I said, I, 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 I knew last year, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. Ask Vicki or ask Carrie. They know up there. They so, know at one time insurance was not covered. Mm -hmm. That was kind of before my time. That was about that was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah that, that and and, uh, and so I've been here 31 years. There's always been Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage. Um, Medicare, I can't remember how that kicked in. Anyway, it's um, it depends on the insurance and the insurance company and the company that the, whatever they uh, whatever they bought. Yeah, the, the individual companies buy particular packages for you. But we do a lot of insurance. The majority of our, our patients, uh, very very few are cash. And I can't do a cash on a Medicare. If Medicare person comes in at 64, uh, and they want to just pay cash. I don't want to fool my insurance. I don't want you to bill my insurance. Okay, I don't have to do that. They'll pay cash to my front desk. Then they turn 65, they can't do it anymore. I've actually broken federal law if I take cash and don't file mm -hmm. Medicare. I have to, I have to um, mm -hmm. file their Medicare for them because they're mm -hmm. a federal uh, patient. Uh, so I don't do it, my staff does it. <laughs> No, listen, Dr. Jones, if he ever tries to explain insurance, just walk away. He has no idea what he's talking about. The many things he's got it down, that particular patient is the exception. So, well, happy to meet everybody.